What is the capital of Peru? Part one of three by Aldred Chase. Dan wondered why it was the rule, as strong as any law, that when they had a trip from school, it had to be a bore. They'd visit things that were uncool and bound to make him snore. The town museum, built of stone, had stood one hundred years, and kids had entered with a groan and left their bore to tears. His mum and gramps and great-gramps too had all been bored as they passed through. Dan and his classmates slouched behind their teacher, Mr. Fripp, who tried to be both fair and kind, though sometimes he could flip. Dan wondered what mischief he'd find to liven up their trip. Young Dan was plump and round and small and had dark curly hair. This energetic bouncy ball would take up any dare and played a fool all day at school, and never seemed to care. They entered the museum through a squeaky wooden door, and walked together two by two across a dusty floor. Dan saw a big and bulky guard was staring at them very hard. The grim-faced guard's aggressive stare from underneath his cap warned Dan to treat the man with care. Because he'd snarl and snap, And Dan could name the very pair Who might provoke a scrap. The two-girl team of Gab and Sash Were champs at making noise, And in a fight the pair could bash A dozen bigger boys, While being bad to make folk mad Was chief among their joys. The brute force came from hefty Gab, The brains belonged to Sash, While Gab looked like a concrete slab, Sash was a skinny slash. Together, working as a team, they'd make kids laugh. Or make them scream. The guard said with a cry of rage, Why do these children come and mock those from a bygone age by chewing bubble gum? This was what Gab and Sash were doing. They grinned at him and kept on chewing. I've told you all, said Mr. Fripp, at school you don't chew gum, and that applies on this school trip, or next time you won't come. All right, Sash said, no need to shout, and she and Gab took their gum out. Dan grinned at this with great delight, and knew what was to come, for once the guard was out of sight, they'd put back in their gum. It was not hard to get it right, unless your brain was numb. Mr. Fripp stopped by a room and looked enthusiastic, as though he could dispel their gloom by calling things fantastic, like cracked pots from a mouldy tomb before the time of plastic. This new display, said Mr. Fripp, is far too good for us to skip. A rich man who calls this town home has long loved ancient Greece and Rome, and wants to show their artworks here, because he holds these ancients dear. He's paid to have good copies made, and in this room they are displayed. They followed Mr. Fripp inside, and they began to snigger, or else they gaped, mouths open wide. The artwork was the trigger. For what they saw was downright rude, a group of statues in the nude. The class all shrieked at Mr. Fripp, and round him they all clustered. This captain of a sinking ship was looking pretty flustered. Dan cried out, adding to the stir, That man is playing nude frisbee, sir. But Fripp was made of sturder stuff. He rallied and cried out, Enough! The ancient Greeks enjoyed their sports, without the need for shirts and shorts. Some sculpture carved this naked man, a coiled spring with his discus, Dan. And here you see great Hercules, who's fought a giant to its knees, and neither of them think it rude to fight their battle in the nude. Old customs that seem odd and strange, Teach us about the way things change. 
we study what the ancients say to understand our lives today. The class was slowly calming down. They'd heard what Fripp had said. But Dan had spied a chance to clown, a statue with no head. He'd fit his face into the space, using his head instead. Dan edged towards the headless man and climbed up from the rear. He gave the severed neck a scan, then prepared to appear. He placed his chin upon the stump and spoke to make his classmates jump. He said, Friends, Romans, countrymen, and those who come here now and then, I've waited here two thousand years, and I am really bored to tears. I am so very glad you've come. Please will you scratch my itchy bum? Some classmates screamed out in alarm, while Sash was choked with laughter, and giggling Gab clung to her arm, and cried, Duff Dan gets dafter. Great uproar swept away the calm, which was what Dan was after. Poor Mr. Fripp stood shocked and weak, his mouth hung open wide. He could not find the words to speak, no matter how he tried. And it was at this awkward stage they heard a chilling howl of rage. The angry guard burst in the room and screamed, You wicked boy! You tread the path that leads to doom by trying to annoy. And soon you will be trapped in gloom, cut off from any joy. Please calm down, Mr. Fripp replied. You may well speak the truth. I am his teacher and I've tried to reason with this youth. But this time, Dan, I'll be severe. You're on detention for a year. The guard said, Focus off today, that's where problems begin. But once we had a better way to teach kids discipline, we flogged them till they wept in pain and swore they'd not do it again. The rules are clear, said Mr. Fripp, that children not be beat. But class, you really must behave. Touch nothing, I repeat. Next stop on our museum tour, is called the Old Town Street. They left the angry guard behind. Dan took the chance to speak his mind. He said, Why was the guard so stroppy? That statue only was a copy. And someone's crazy, I'd have said, to copy one that needs a head. Be quiet, Dan, said Mr. Fripp, who sounded like he might well flip. Will Dan learn his lesson and become a model of good behaviour? My guess is probably not. Find out what further trouble he gets into in part two.